how much God really understands the human brain and how much he understands our psychology because he's created us. He, he has made us and he understands that we are forgetful people. And that's why in the Old Testament you see the year of Jubilee is this event that happens and it's a recurring thing to remember, to rejoice uh, that God is with them, that he's delivered them from Egypt, uh, to remember to, to show compassion to one another. Uh, and we see uh, God as one of the Ten Commandments to remember the Sabbath and keep it holy, this recurring thing that we need to follow to be rested in God, to be spiritually, physically, and mentally and emotionally rested. And so these things that he's provided in the Old Testament, the New Testament, help us to go back to him. These things that we can remember, these events, these holidays. And one of the most famous, of course, is the Last Supper. When Jesus is meeting with his disciples, uh, and he's alluded to, to the Last Supper before. We studied in uh, the, the Prairie Heights lunch Bible study. We got to the part where Jesus is talking about, I am the bread of life. And then as we continued reading those verses, you see this look of horror on their faces because it starts sounding like cannibalism. It's like whoever consumes my flesh and drinks my blood will have eternal life. Uh, and so they, they obviously, these fifth and sixth graders are like, what is going on here? And many times, yes, the Bible can be confusing like that. But as we get to the Last Supper, Jesus meeting with his disciples in the upper room, it all begins to make sense. Uh, because Jesus, uh, he, he calls them together, and even then, the disciples are still confused uh, at all that is, that is going on. And uh, Luke 22 uh, is where, I mean, it happens in all four Gospels, but Luke 22 is the one we're talking about today. It says in verse 14, When the hour came, Jesus and his apostles reclined at the table, and he said to them, I have eagerly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer, for I will tell you, I will not eat it again until it finds fulfillment in the kingdom of God. And after taking the cup, he gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among you. For I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took bread, gave thanks and broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. But the hand of him who is going to betray me is with mine on the table. The Son of Man will go as it has been decreed, but woe to that man who betrays him. Of course, referring to Judas. And he does this. And in the other Gospels as well, he says, continue to do this. And all of this was to point to remember the sacrifice that Jesus was about to make on the cross. And here at Pleasant View, we take communion every Sunday. It's just a, a cup with a little piece of bread and a cup with juice in it. And it's not just something that we do every Sunday morning because it's, well, it's just what we've always done. But it's just another one of these memories, another one of these helpers, so that we don't forget why we gather. Uh, in their day, they would meet every single day, and they would have a dinner together, uh, and they would remember the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Paul says in, in his letters, do not neglect the meeting together and of this Last Supper. And he corrects many things that they're doing wrong because of how important it is to hold on to this memory. Because in the busyness of our lives, we can so easily forget, we can get distracted, to forget what it's all about. Why do we come here to worship God? Why do we sing these praises to him? Why do we sing praises maybe to songs that we don't even like? Uh, or, or why do we go and continue to hear from God's word and encourage one another? Why is it important? And it's to remember what he's done for us the sacrifice that he was to make on the cross, his body broken, and his blood purposefully shed for us. So as we uh, are about to, to head, that we have communion in the four corners uh, of the room. We'll hang on to that and take it all together after a time. But during this time, uh, I'd like us to reflect on that sacrifice and maybe some of the things that we've forgotten about what God has done for us. You know, one, one more of those 10,000 reasons. What has God truly done for us? And remember that as we take communion. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you. And we pray that as we're about to take communion, 
and as we take some time to reflect, you help us to understand the depth of the sacrifice that you made for us. As we reflect maybe on our sins and the ways that we've fallen short, God, we give those up to you. And we pray that you look into our lives, into our spirit, and point out the things that we need to give over to you. It's in your name that we pray. Amen. Again, from Luke chapter 22, verse 19. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it. And he gave it to them, saying, This is my body given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's do the same. In the same way, after the supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is poured out for you. Let's drink and remember the same. Would you pray with me? Father God, once again, we thank you for the gift of your son on the cross, knowing that he would rise again from the grave to bring us the hope of eternal life. And God, we pray that as we give our offerings to you, as we just give back some of the resources that you have given us that can be used to further your kingdom, to reach the lost and bring hope to those who desperately need it. God, we pray that you work through this church and through the ministries that we partner with to reach those who have been forgotten, to reach those who may have been looked over, and to bring them hope. God, we pray all of this in your son's precious and holy name. Amen. couple of things while Stephen's raising it up. Must have been somebody really short last week. Um, I forgot to thank Stephen also for his compassion while I was gone on vacation, especially your concern about me eating liver and dumpling soup. If you were here, you remember he mentioned that, and, uh, but I think he was concerned to make me sick and he had to preach longer. A couple of things here very quickly um, while we go get ready here. Um, ICOM, International Conference on Missions, today is the last day you can sign up online if you want to. Um, you can still sign up there if you're planning on going. If you're thinking about going and you want to go on Saturday, um, we're, some of us are going down on Saturday. We're looking at maybe renting a van if need be, but I need to know today if you're thinking about going on that Saturday. So make sure you sign that list back there and let me know about that. Also, you notice that we're having a trying student card shower uh, get $10 gift cards, and uh, you guys make sure you're here December the 4th, and we're going to pass those out. So just a little bit more of appreciation for the uh, trying students that attend here. I know you all been looking at my forehead, and you've been wondering what in the world to happen to that guy. I'd like to say that I, and my knuckles are all skinned up too, I'd like to say that I was defending my wife's honor, or saving the dog from a 
catastrophe. Or, you know, that ball bat I talk about she keeps beside the bed. Uh, I turned my back on her when I shouldn't have. Um, none of that's true. Friday, I was doing more than I should have. I forget sometimes how old I am. And my body reminds me, and I hauled three pickup loads of dirt and stone for a project I'm doing where that big tree blew over in our front yard. Cindy tried to get me to take a break and get something to eat, and I said, no, i got to get this done. But when I finally got all done, I went back into the house, and um, I was shot. And those of you who've been in my house, I came from the laundry room into the kitchen. There's that little threshold. Well, I stumbled on it. She was in the bathroom there. She said, you should have heard it from in there. I hit the door with my shoulder. Those nice, really, what kind of plates are those? What? Depression glass. glass. I knocked that off, broke one of those, knocked stuff everywhere. I ended up clear across the room doing a face plant into the dog cage. (laughs) You can laugh. It's okay. And uh, (laughs) if the door had been open, I might have got my head stuck in it. But the door was closed. I bent it. Fortunately, the dog wasn't in there. It scared him to death. And I'm laying there on the floor. She comes running out. Dog's trying to jump on me. I finally roll over. The dog's trying. I said, I went like this. I said, hey, I think I'm bleeding. And uh, dog's trying to lick my face. I said, get that dog off of me. And sent my kids, uh, uh, grandkids, a picture of my forehead. They were so compassionate. So compassionate. They finally came up with the idea that Cindy needed to buy some trail cams and put them around the house inside because they said, you'll do this again, Dad. That's worth some money on Funniest Home Videos. So anyway, that's, that's the compassion, probably all that, all that I deserve. But it's been interesting walking around and people trying to look at my forehead but not look at my forehead. <laughs> that's been kind of interesting, too. All right. Anyway, we're here. Um, today, um, some of us went to the um, Right to Life banquet where Tim Tebow was the speaker phenomenal night, just an amazing night. They had 1,200 people there. Um, We just had a great night. We had one table full, hopefully maybe next year. Uh, In the spring, they're going to have the beardless brother from Duck Dynasty, the one that's the preacher. He and his wife are going to be there in the spring banquet, and they're going to be uh, speakers. And poor Amy, uh, she couldn't eat anything because of her gluten thing, so she had a salad and two pieces of cheesecake, which I think that's a pretty good meal. But anyway, uh, she won one of the door prizes out of 1,200 people, so we were glad for that. But anyway, Tim Tebow's got three dogs. And Cindy won't let me use this name, but one of his dogs' name is Chunk. That's a great name for a dog. I said, let's change Snickerdoodle's name to Chunk. She said, he don't quite fit the mold of a Chunk. Well, he's a beggar. Snickerdoodle's a terrible beggar. He knows when you've got food, even when I made a cup of hot tea just sitting there. And I've been trying to teach him. I go like this. And I've been trying to get him to realize that means I don't have anything for you. No snacks. Okay? Keep that image in the back of your mind. We're going to come back to it later. Recently I read a story of a preacher. And this is a true story on an Easter Sunday. Uh, this one guy came out. And the preacher kind of grabbed him and pulled him off the side. And he said, brother, you need to join the army of the Lord. That guy said, preacher, I am in the army of the Lord. He said, you are? How come I only see you on Christmas and Easter? He said, because I'm in the secret service. (laughs) That's a true story. But you know, unfortunately, a lot of people, that's how they consider themselves in their Christian life. Now, I've been reading a really interesting book. It's a hard book to read. It's like 12, 1,500 pages, and they're paper-thin pages. Um, It's the memoirs of Ulysses S. Grant from the time he was a child growing up through the Civil War. And and it's been a fascinating, fascinating read as I've gone through this. And because I'm kind of into Civil War stuff, you know that. But it's just been a fascinating read. But it's interesting, at the very beginning, he talked about the fact that both on the South and the North, everybody thought it was just going to be one quick skirmish. It it wasn't going to last that long. Little did they know that it was going to be four years and hundreds of thousands killed. But, but anyway, he talked about there were so many that signed up, they thought it would be a glamorous thing to do. They thought it would be just a, a lot of fun. Politicians signed up because they thought it would enhance their political career on and on and on. But he said at the very beginning, uh, there were so many desertions because there wasn't real commitment. They thought it was going to be an adventure. 
uh, progress in the uh, political arena, things like that. But as he pointed out, one of the primary functions of the military is to prepare for war. And you need to know that if you sign up. Towards the end, I'm about three-fourths of the way through the Civil War now reading this. Those that were left there towards the end were the ones that were really committed. The ones that understood what the army existed for. They were to defend people, to fight the enemy, to contend against evil. But there were so many that joined up for a free ride, so to speak. And that kind of mentality undermines the military of any nation. And and as I've been reading through this, I realize that same mentality many times exists within the church. And it can undermine the purpose of the church. You see, too often, believers sign up for the benefits. They expect Jesus to be there for them. They don't expect to be there for him. Uh, A lot of times when I talk to people about the church, I said, no, understand, just because you become a Christian, that doesn't mean all your problems are going to be gone. Everything's going to be solved. Matter of fact, sometimes they may get worse, but you're going to have the Lord on your side. You're going to have the Holy Spirit to give you the strength that you need, and that makes all the difference in the world. Now, that's the issue Jesus is addressing here in Matthew 16, and this is kind of a a little bit of a practical application about what I preached about a couple of weeks ago. He's here explaining to disciples that they are a part of his army. He's trying to get them to realize that he's called them to war and they need to be making a decision. In Matthew 16, 24 and 25, Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me will find it. In other words, Jesus was saying, folks, it's not about The benefits is about picking up your cross, about denying yourself, about getting into the trenches on a daily basis and standing up for me. It's all about being serious in in our commitment to Jesus. Now, understand, these guys had been with him for about two years. He's been training them. He's been teaching them. He's been exposing them to God's power. They've sat at his feet. They've listened. They've watched as he taught Uh, they've seen him heal the deaf, the the mute, the lame. He's seen them raise someone from the dead. They've seen those miracles. He came walking on water out there to him in the boat. He he woke up there in the boat in the same sea and simply said, peace be still. And the storm immediately stopped. They've seen him feed 5,000 men with their women, with their children, with five loaves and two small fish. He did that again with over 4,000. And just a few weeks before we find this story in Matthew 14, he had been sending his disciples out to minister, to preach, to heal. But the time's getting short. Jesus' arrest, his crucifixion was just a few weeks away. And he was trying to get them to recognize the seriousness of what this was all about. And the first thing he does here is that he lays the foundation of their allegiance to him. He lays the foundation for our allegiance to him. In Matthew 16, 13 through 16, he called them together and he said, Who do men say that I am? They replied, Some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others say Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But Jesus said, Who do you say that I am? And Peter, being Peter, never lost for words, immediately says, You're the Christ, the Son of the living God. That's what he wanted to hear. That's what he wanted them to get to realize. He, he commends that. But then he goes on to explain that his final battle was coming up that he was going to be going to Jerusalem. He was going to be betrayed. He was going to be suffering at the hands of the elders, the the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and he was going to be killed. But then on the third day, he was going to be raised to life. In Matthew 16, 22, Peter said, wait a minute. Never, Lord, this shall never happen to you. That's That's not what Peter signed up for. You see, he was still in that state of confusion, thinking that Jesus was going to be the the Messiah, the king, that would help them overcome the rule of Rome. And Peter said, that's what I signed up for, not this. You're not going to die. You can't die. Then Peter again says, if anyone would come after me, to Peter he says, if anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, follow me, for whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life will find it. Again, Jesus is saying, guys, it's war. And it's going to be tough. And as I'm reading through this book, that's what many who first signed up for the Civil War faced. After the first big battle, 
uh, the Battle of Bull Run. Some call it the Battle of First Manassas. All of a sudden, they realize, hey, this is real. We can die. Uh, this is some serious fighting going on here. And so many deserted. Because that's not what they wanted to do. They didn't think that's what it was going to be all about. They thought, of course, talking about the north with Grant, they thought, we're going to go out there, we're going to show our force, and the south's just going to run. Not much to it. It's all going to be over. But once people started dying, once people began getting wounded, the horrible situations they find themselves in, they said, eh, that's not what we signed up for, and thousands deserted. And, and that's what Jesus is telling his disciples. Guys, this isn't going to be easy. It's going to be tough. This morning in our lesson uh, that we're having for the men, uh, the author pointed out as he was talking on the video, Christianity is not a playground. It's a battlefield. And we need to recognize that. And we face the possibility of suffering and danger. Matthew 5, Jesus said this in verses 11 and 12. Blessed are you when people insult you, persecute you, falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad because great is your reward in heaven. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Then in Matthew 10, he said, all men will hate you because of me. But he who stands firm to the end will be saved. Paul writing to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3, everyone who wants to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. Not maybe, but will be persecuted. Paul, one of the greatest Christians that we read about, listen to what he went through as he tells us in 2 Corinthians 11. Five times I received from the Jews the 40 lashes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and a day in an open sea. I've been constantly on the move. I've been in danger from rivers, bandits, my own countrymen, in danger from Gentiles in the city, in the country, in sea, in danger from false brothers. I've labored and toiled. I've gone without food. I've gone without sleep. I've gone without water. I've been cold and naked. Besides everything else, I face daily the pressure of my concern for the churches. And we know that the Apostle Paul, as well as all the others except John, eventually they were all executed for their faith. Why? Why did they do that? Why did they put up with all that suffering and eventually death? It's because they were convinced that Jesus was worth it. He was convinced that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God, who came to die for our sins and rise from the dead to give us hope. He was convinced that he was in a war and there were souls to be won. He was convinced that the fate of men and women around him depending upon his faithfulness as a soldier of Jesus. When he was asked before King Agrippa in Acts 26, why are you doing this? You remember what he did? He didn't try to defend himself. He simply said that Jesus told him, I am sending you to the Gentiles to open their eyes, turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan to God, so that they may receive forgiveness of sin and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. So Paul believed that. And because he believed it, he decided it was worth denying himself, taking up his cross, and following after Jesus. Now most of us aren't going to face problems like that. In this country, we're probably not going to be whipped or stoned or beaten with rods because of what we believe more than likely, we're faced with the challenge of realizing that Christianity is not a Sunday thing. What do I mean? I mean, our faith calls us to be faithful to Jesus 24 hours a day, seven days a week, not just on Sundays. As Christians, we're soldiers of Christ, and we're at, <clears throat> at battle, at war with Satan every day. Now, like I said, we're soldiers, we've been called to war, and given those facts, sometimes, as Christians, we kind of misunderstand what God wants us to do in this conflict. You see, we believe, falsely, that God calls us to fight just like the world fights. The world fights by getting angry. Do you ever get angry? The world fights by getting even. Do you ever want to get even? The world fights by doing whatever they have to to defeat their enemy, the old idea that the end justifies the means. I've seen Christians 
to use mean and hateful words to get their way. I've seen Christians who have spread gossip and rumors to discredit people they disagree with. I've seen Christians destroy preachers and churches because they felt like they were in the right and the preacher or the church was in the wrong. It had nothing to do with Scripture, but it was all about their rights. I remember years ago uh, when I was preaching and I was also doing the youth because we didn't have a youth minister, and um, a, a Bible college had a concert. And, and I took the kids up to it. It was a weekend type thing. And this was years ago when music was just starting to change and we're getting more of the modern songs and stuff like that. And they had this guy and he was Christian concert. Can't, I wish I could remember his name, but I don't. But he was on the rock edge and he was loud. It was good. But about halfway through the concert, one of the professors from that college got up and said, this stops here. This is from Satan. This music is not church music. And I remember the guy, he said, won't you at least let me finish my concert? Because I'm sure he had a powerful witness he was going to share. And he said, no, this is it. This is over. Well, two things. Number one, when I took the kids back, we were sitting around, we were kind of having a little session talking, and they said, why did they do that? And I said, I don't know. I said, a lot of older people don't like this music. I don't know that I like it the greatest, but it's, it's, it was good music. It had a great message in it. And I thought to myself, that college messed up. They obviously didn't do their homework. They maybe heard this was a good guy to be there for kids, so they went and had him come, and they didn't know what kind of music he was really going to sing. They hadn't listened to him, because I'm sure the guy didn't all of a sudden say, hey, I'm going to change everything I do for this concert tonight. I've seen churches do that with preachers. They fired a preacher, he comes in, and he starts preaching, all of a sudden they say, well, we don't like that. How come he's doing stuff like that? We don't want those changes. They didn't do their homework. But whose fault is it? That's not what we're supposed to be doing, folks. Paul says in 2 Corinthians 10, 4 through 6, the weapons we fight with are not the weapons of the world. On the contrary, they have divine power to demolish strongholds. We demolish arguments and every preposition that sets itself up against the knowledge of God and take captive every thought to make it obedient to Christ. Then in 2 Timothy 2, 24 through 26, the Lord's servant must not quarrel. Instead, he must be kind to everyone, able to teach, not resentful. Those who oppose him, he must gently instruct in the hope that God will grant them repentance, leading them to knowledge of the truth, that they may come to their senses and escape from the trap of the devil who is taking them captive to do his will. We're not called to deny ourselves and take up our cross so that we can beat people over the head with it. That is not what we're called to do. We're not called to do things our way because our way is based on getting back at someone because we've been offended. Our way of doing things uh, to people that have trampled on our rights. And we often hear people say, how dare they do that? I'm going to get even with them. Well, let me, let me in on your little secret here, folks. When you or I get angry or vengeful towards someone, when we get argumentative or when we get into a shouting match, it's a sign that we have forgotten to deny ourselves and have become tempted to pick up our cross and beat somebody up with it. We need to remember that. We don't fight like the world fights. We have a serious battle that we're in, but we don't fight like the world fights. You see, we think that's the way to make war. But God's way of making war is to help us to understand that we're not here to get even. We're not here to destroy people. Why? Because they're not the enemy. They're our objective. Satan is the enemy. Satan holds these folks captive to his will. Ephesians 6 Paul said, our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil. Now, that doesn't make sense to anybody that doesn't belong to Jesus. You see, we think, if somebody hurts me, then I'm going to hurt them back. But Jesus said, turn the other cheek. If you hurt them, and if you want to do something mean to them, then Jesus says, wait a minute, you're supposed to bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. You see, our enemy is not Al-Qaeda. It's not Iran. It's not the Russians. It's not the Chinese. It's not the North Koreans. It's not the homosexuals. It's not the atheists. It's not the worker down the plant that cusses like a banshee. It's not the person that says mean things about you behind your back. It's not the guy that pulled out in front of you, and you blew your horn at him, and he gave you a rude gesture. You see, our enemy is not Republicans, Democrats, libertarians the enemy is satan folks and if we beat satan then we win 
the battle. That's what God here is telling us. And the only way that we're going to beat him is to take his captives away. It's when we turn the hearts of those that are lost to sin around and bring them back to Jesus. That's what it's all about. Let me try to give you some quick practical application here. First of all, showing love and compassion. And don't misunderstand this. Showing love and compassion that we stand for Jesus does not mean, it does not mean that we don't point out the seriousness of sin. Now, I was going to put a picture up here of Martin's truck, but I decided not to do that. Martin's wreck was almost, it was over a year ago, uh, last month. And, and throughout these 12, 13 months, I'm always asked the question, how's Martin doing? And I try to give him a medical report, but I always say, but we're just blessed to still have him here with us. Now, if they've not seen a picture of his truck, what it looked like after that big delivery truck plowed into the side of it and destroyed it, they really don't understand what I mean when I say we're blessed to have him with us. But, but if I get my phone out and I show them that picture, they go, oh my gosh. You see, they don't realize the blessings that we've received until they see how bad the situation really was. And if we simply tell people that God loves them and wants them to go to heaven, it's welcome news, but easily dismissed. Instead, non-Christians need to understand the bad news first. And the bad news is without God, we're without hope. We're sinners. We're separated from God. And the punishment for our sins is eternity in hell. Now, that's awful news. But then we tell them the good news. In 2 Corinthians 5, we remind them God made him, Jesus, who had no sin, to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. He arose from the grave and said, I am the resurrection of life. He who believes in me will live even though they die. Say so they hear the bad news, but we also got to share the good news. Psychiatrist Dr. Carl Menninger wrote this, Whatever happened to sin? His premise was that the rise of secularism combined with the ignorance of God's word, produced a culture with a numbed conscience and a little awareness of right and wrong. Therefore, when presenting the gospel, he suggests preachers and teachers should begin by explaining the reality of sin and the need for repentance. You remember Jesus on his very first sermon in Mark chapter 1, verses 14, 15. After John was put in prison, Jesus went to Galilee proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. John, as he was writing to his readers, he started out with bad news. In 1 John 1, 8, if we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But then he gave us good news in the very next verse. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins and purify us from all righteousness. The Apostle Paul said in Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death. Bad news. But he followed it up with, but the gift of God is eternal life in Jesus Christ. On the day of Pentecost, Look what Peter said in Acts 2, 22 and 23. Fellow Israelites, listen to this. Jesus of Nazareth was handed over to you by God's deliberate plan and foreknowledge, and you, with the help of the wicked man, put him to death by nailing him to the cross. But then he gave him good news in verses 22 through 24. But God raised him from the dead, freeing him from the agony of death, because it was impossible for death to keep its hold on him. When the people heard this, they were cut to the heart. Then Peter said to them and the other apostles, Brothers, what shall we do? The people were convicted of their sin, hearing these bad news. He said, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for forgiveness of sin. This is an on and on scenario throughout Scripture. People heard the bad news, but it was followed with good news. Preacher and author David Jeremiah said this, with the rise of secularism, the concept of sin is fading. If there's no God, at least no personal God, there are no divine rules to govern us. So why feel guilty? One person said, I've come to the realization that I don't believe in sin, but I still admire Jesus a lot. The contradiction of that statement was lost on the man. He, was a, he has a form of godliness without its power, purpose, conviction, or reality. You see, people have to recognize their need for Jesus before they're ready to accept Jesus. It, it, it's a dangerous times where we ignore the reality of sin. And just simply try to talk about the wonderful grace of Jesus. Now, how do you put that into your own daily life? I can't give you a pat answer. And the reason I can't give you a pat answer in how you stand for Jesus in your own daily life is because you 
have different families, different individuals you're in contact with, different situ- You know, we all have different situations we find ourselves in. But, but the main thing we have to understand that we stand up for the truth. And I realize that that's not easy when you're dealing with your friends and your family, but if you really love those people, if you're really concerned about their destiny, then we unswervingly, unashamedly stay true to God's word, no exceptions. No exceptions. And I know personally, in some situations I've found myself in with my family and friends, that is not easy. But how much do you love someone? You remember at the very beginning when I showed you my hands? My friend, Jim Freeman, he was up here when you had your 50th anniversary thing for me. And I've told you many times, we talk a lot on the phone. Confide in each other a lot. He told me not too awfully long ago about a man that had been attending his church. And he had no relationship with the Lord and didn't really want one. Jim said, I wasn't sure why he came to church a whole lot. And Jim had talked to him a number of times about his relationship to the Lord. And he said, oh, that, that's good stuff, preacher, but I don't need that. Well, Jim said a few weeks ago he was going in for some pretty serious surgery. And they didn't know if he was going to make it or not through the surgery. So Jim said, I went and visited him. I was sitting there in the hospital room. And the preacher more or less said, what are you doing here? The guy said to Jim, what are you doing here, preacher? He said, you know I don't really believe in all that stuff. You're just wasting your time. And Jim said, I went like this. He said, I don't want your blood on my hands. The guy said, what do you mean? Jim said, someday I'm going to stand before God as I enter into eternity. And I don't want anybody's blood on my hands because I didn't tell him about Jesus. That's my prayer. That when I stand before God, I can say, I don't have anybody's blood on my hands because I've done my best to stand for truth unswervingly even in tough times and say if you don't have Jesus if you don't change your ways you can go to hell but the good news is there's hope and it's only through Jesus let's pray Father I thank you for your love and I thank you for your word thank you for the privilege that we have of sharing and it's not easy it's getting harder all the time it seems like lines are being drawn and then they're changed as far as truth and all those things we talked about a couple weeks ago But Father, help us to realize that we're not bearers of bad news, but we're seekers of truth. And that's what we need to share with people, the truth of your word. That some things are wrong, and there's consequences. But there's hope. There's grace through your son Jesus. May we be the bearers of that truth, unashamedly, as we come in contact with people that we love and care about. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Let's be standing, shall we? Savior, oh.
Good to see everybody here this morning. I've been trying to catch Lee and his wife here in the auditorium at the same time. She's working with the kids right now. Anything new in your life, Lee? Yeah? yeah? <laughs> You're a man of few words. You want to elaborate a little bit here? <laughs> I'm glad you didn't say something that everybody says anymore. We're pregnant. Men aren't pregnant. But anyway, I, I, when people say that, they say, come on. I may look like it, but I ain't pregnant. You know, come on. So congratulations, buddy. You have a great week. So build your kingdom here. Let the darkness fear. Show your mind. Set your church on 